Good evening. I'm Crystal Wessel. I'm the now early morning host at All Classical Portland, a community-funded radio station in town that I hope that you all know about, yes? And that we all are supporters of, yes? Just one quick little note, we ended our fundraiser on Tuesday, as promised, after 10 days, but we're about 80-some percent of the way to our overall goal, so if you haven't yet contributed to this gem of a resource, I invite you to do that online at allclassical.org. And speaking of that website, this chat will be archived at the website sometime tonight, so if you want to go watch it again, you can do that at the website as well. Okay, plug is over. This guy is the internationally renowned violinist Vadim Gluzman. So far, so good. <laughs> and did I say your name correctly? Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes, correct? absolutely. Vadim Gluzman, okay. Uh, I wanna... It's as far as I remember. <laughs> I'm looking forward to digging into the violin concerto that you're playing with us tonight, but first, um, I wanna talk a little bit about you and your remarkable violin before we jump into this crazy piece of music you've brought to us? The short version is uh, some 20, gosh, 23 years ago, when I just arrived in, in, in the States to study. That was back in Dallas, Texas. And f for whatever reason, the local radio station decided to take an interview with me. I spoke no English. And I addressed my uh, Colombian friend sharing my concern of what I'm going to do <laughs> at the interview. And he said, oh, don't, don't you worry about it. Just say you're Vadim and you played the violin. <laughs> and that's what I did. <laughs> so that's the short version. Let's, let's expand just a little bit. <laughs> you uh, grew up in Soviet Russia? Uh, depends what we mean by growing up. I lived in what used to be... Soviet Union until I was 15, moving to Israel at that age, and ever since I'm Israeli, uh, I split my time between Chicago and Tel Aviv on unexplicable basis of, of touring and weather. Uh, that's about it. Well, you run a music festival in Chicago. Yes, uh, we, there is a... A festival is maybe an overstatement, although we call it a festival. Uh, it's, it's a three concerts event uh, that lasts a week uh, from A to Z, and all it is, it's uh, friends getting together uh, and between meals, rehearsing and giving concerts. Sounds like fun. Um, let's go back to those teenage years when you said that you, you moved to Israel... 15, 16, 16. excuse me. I, I, I on a, a whim, you went to... How did, tell, tell me about this, um, a meeting with Isaac Stern at age 16. Uh, that was fun. Uh, one, of those, one of those moments of, of sheer stupidity. Uh, I did know, of course, who Isaac Stern was, although in Russian his name was pronounced Isaac Stern. And all I knew that this was a great violinist. Uh, I had absolutely no idea what this man represented, from saving Carnegie Hall to basically building every cultural institution in Israel and supporting it throughout his life. Uh, somehow I heard that he was listening to young violinists in Jerusalem, made my way to Jerusalem, opened the door and announced to the receptionist, in Russian of course, uh, that I wanted to play for Isaac, and she said, well, welcome to the club. <laughs> this is, uh, this particular audition was arranged two years in advance. I, I had no understanding of how, how, how the world turns. And that very moment, Isaac comes in through the door, points at me on his way. He never stopped, he always walked. Asked who that is, and she told him that there was a boy who wants to play for you, and he said, go warm up, I'll have five minutes. And that was it. Uh, two hours later, I, I had a new violin, a scholarship, and what, what not. And, so and, he, he was, and also an understanding that I know nothing about music and life and everything else. So he was a mentor to you for quite some time. Well, I, I wouldn't over, over, overestimate, but, but uh, he's been a great influence and, until now. I, I, I still think to, to the meetings that, we, that we've had, especially when these meetings were with violin in, in hand, and I happened to be playing the repertoire that I was playing for him. That's st still a great source of inspiration. 
If I asked you to name one bit of advice or guidance that he gave you? That's very simple. Okay, Nothing is good enough. <laughs> <laughs> and be, believe it or not, it's, it's, it's an incredible uh, engine. Uh, once you actually realize that nothing is good enough. Wow. It's, uh, it's incredible. It, it, it d doesn't make your life any better. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, that seems like a good segue. Is the current violin you're playing on good enough? Because you play a Stradivarius that is rich with history. Can you talk a little bit about this violin? Uh, 325 years young. Uh, built by Stradivari, uh, and the, the story of this violin is, is lays on the shoulders of one man, that is Leopold Auer, the, the great, they all call him Russian, but he was as much Russian as I'm Chinese. He was a Hungarian Jew, uh, but he made mo most of his career in St. Petersburg as, as the professor at the conservatory and what was called the Tsar's violinist. Um, and he only taught Yasha Heifetz, Nathan Milstein, Misha Elman, FM Zimbalist. <laughs> the, the list goes on and on and on. Um, so with this violin in hand, he premiered Glazunov Violin Concerto, which was written for him. With this violin, he uh, declined the dedication of Tchaikovsky for his violin concerto, saying that this was uh, unviolinistic and therefore unplayable. Uh, if you think back to all the great violin solos from all those bal ballets of Tchaikovsky, the Swan Lake, Nut Nutcracker, you name it, uh, each and every violin solo was played for the first time by him. And that was one of his roles as a Tsar's violinist. He would march into the pit, he had a little podium, uh, play the solo and leave. He was never part of the orchestra. The show went on, he played the solo and left. But. So this, this violin has seen quite, quite a bit. It was this violin that Tchaikovsky wrote his violin concerto for, and you've recorded the Tchaikovsky violin concerto. Did you play it on, on that violin? Yeah. Perfect, I love that. Um, so how does one come to play a violin that's so rich of history and rare and treasured? How did you get your hands on this thing? Well, it's, it's on loan to me from um, organization called the Stradivari Society of Chicago. They, they find two kinds of people, those who can afford those instruments and those who cannot. <laughs> and they put them together. <laughs> <laughs> and no, no, normally those that cannot, they, they have one exception, they, they can play them. Well, so the, how did they just call you up and say, hey? Well, they, they knew that I existed. And, uh, they, they, this is almost 20 years ago. Uh, they must have heard my debut in, in Ravinia, I, I, if I'm not mistaken. And they knew I needed a better instrument, so sometime after that I, I had a message on my, we still had these machines with tapes, remember? <laughs> uh, that, that there is a fiddle available if you want to come to Chicago and pick it up, you're welcome. So I did. And can you describe that first moment when you played it? Was it just... Mm, Angels no. sang? No. no, really? No, uh, it, 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 it takes two to tango, you know, it, it, and you, one has to learn to tango. It does, doesn't, we say, we say in Hebrew, it doesn't walk by itself. <laughs> um, but there was a strange moment w when I was actually given the violin. Uh, it's, it's a v big uh, um, reception room at, at Banyan Fushi, which is the parent organization of this Strat Society. Um, and it's full of pictures and, and posters and whatnot. So I'm, I'm given the violin, I hold it, look at it, and I feel, you know, sometimes you have this distinct feeling that someone is watching you from behind. It's almost physical. I turn around and behind me on the wall is the huge portrait of Leopold Auer looking at me. <laughs> I, it, 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 it made me shiver for the next couple of years that I would be coming to the shop and, I, by now I got used to it. <laughs> and is this the violin for you? Do you think you'll play it as long as you're playing a violin or...? You, you would have to ask the owner of the violin. <laughs> I didn't know whether there's a... I'm not. 
curious, I don't know, whether there's a part of you who kind of yearns to try other things and maybe develop a new sound with a new instrument? Mm. Violinists do, do that uh, uh, almost subconsciously. When violinists meet, we show each other who has what. It's, uh, like dogs sniff each other. <laughs> <laughs> This is our way of, 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 of <laughs> greeting. Uh, so, of course, I've, I, I've tried a gazillion of different instruments, and some made an incredible impression, some didn't, but very little can, can substitute, if anything, uh, for an actual relationship with the instrument. And we've been playing together for almost 20 years, 18 years, I'd say. Uh, it, 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 it's it's a quite quite a high cost. <laughs> Can you guys hear Vadim in the back? I noticed oh. you're being, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is Vadim Gluzman, who is the soloist for tonight's you think, concert. You think they forgot? Well, there's people coming in all the time, you see. <laughs> Just want to make sure everybody knows who you are. Um, thank you for bringing this concerto to us. Uh, show of hands, how many are familiar with the Offertorium Concerto by Sofia Gubaidulina? My gosh, one. One hand. So, two. two. <laughs> let's dive into this thing. Thank you. <laughs> because this is not a Tchaikovsky Concerto. This is not a Sibelius Concerto. This is completely different. Well, it is. Uh, and I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Uh, well, re written in, in very end of 1970s, beginning of 1980s. If you remember that, that, that was the, the height of the Cold War. This was the, the arguably the darkest time in, in Russian history, maybe next to 1937, the wave of terror. Um, written by a woman <clears throat> who was born into a family of, of Imam, the, the Muslim preacher uh, who turned uh, to, to, to be Russian Orthodox and openly religious person, which was by itself a, a, a terribly dangerous thing to do in Soviet Union. Uh, and she writes a concerto for the great Gidon Kramer, who just as she was writing it, defected to the West. So he became the enemy of the state. Uh, and not only that, she writes a concerto which she herself uh, call, calls her passion, the story of Jesus. Uh, and she's basically, uh, without, without any fear, or at least known to us, she declares it. And she sends the score to Gidon to Germany, and he premieres it in Berlin at the Berliner Festspiele. Uh, and somehow she does not go to jail, she survives it. Uh, she then revised the concerto five years later, and we, we today play the, the revised version. The language that she uses will be, uh, I think for lack of a better word, uh, shocking. And shocking in, in, in every level, uh, fr from, from the way it sounds to what it does to us emotionally, and does to us emotionally on stage and, and in the audience. I've experienced this, this piece listening in, in, in the hall. Um, it, it truly is a, an experience, it's a journey. Uh, she takes the theme of, of musical offering of, of Johann Sebastian Bach, which actually is not by Bach, but by, by Friedrich the Great. Uh, and she talks about something very, well, simple, but, but yet, uh, very, very complex. The offering, what, what, what does it mean? Uh, and f from artist offering him or herself to, for, for sake of art uh, to, of course, the ultimate offering. Uh, and she talks about a very simple human uh, uh, qualities, uh, bravery, honesty, uh, and I, I had the fortune of uh, working with her. I've, I've played both of her concertos and had a number of meetings with her and on, on her music. And it made me realize something that actually this music can give us hope. Uh, just to look at this. Uh, uh, 
a music written by a Muslim-born Russian Orthodox woman played for you by an Israeli violinist with an American orchestra conducted by, by a British, con British conductor. <laughs> uh, and everything we speak of in this music is absolutely universally important. So it will be excruciatingly painful, terribly beautiful, and I do mean each and every word. Uh, I hope you are with me on it. I think the, the word you used when we talked earlier this week on the phone for Northwest Previews on All Classical Portland was violent. This music can be very violent. Not can be, it, it is. <laughs> It is because it is part of our world, unfortunately, and uh, no artist can be detached from it. No artist has ever been detached from the world that they, they live in. And unfortunately, the piece is, was written, as I said, um, 35 years ago. The world didn't become any better. One moment that is haunting to me is the final third of the piece, because the we need to talk about the structure of the piece yes. too, but the final third is this chorale, it's this hymn, it's haunting, it's disturbing, it's unbelievably beautiful. And there's something going on with the prepared piano and the harps as you're singing that chorale with your violin, it's just eerie. Can you talk about what that symbolizes? Yes, that's, that's, that's another image which uh, I do think is important uh, this is not final thought, this is the actual coda of, of the piece. The last, I don't know, maybe five, four or five minutes of it. Uh, it is, it's a Russian Orthodox hymn, and it, it truly is unbelievably beautiful. And then from time to time you will hear very prominently coming from that part of the stage, uh, rather disturbed sounds of, of prepared piano, um, harp and chimes imitating the sound of, of Kremlin currents, the bells on Moscow Kremlin. Uh, and, <clears throat> excuse me, the, this sound, that exact, she, she's imitating it basically note per note, except she gives it to us in a quite perverse and very painful manner. Um, that sound accompanied us every morning, every evening, every afternoon on news channels everywhere. You would hear it in the, from the radio, on TV. This was sort of a symbol of the, of the Soviet power. And that contrast of the most soothing, the most incredibly beautiful and, and, and uh, almost calming uh, chorale that is intercepted by this relentless, uh, 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 cold and disturbed sound of these currents. It's, it's quite, am quite amazing. Okay, so the program begins in quite an inventive way. As we spoke about, this violin concerto utilizes a tune originally by Frederick the Great, but uh, attributed to Bach here, the theme from his musical offering. And the program tonight starts with Webern's orchestration of that tune. So you'll be able to get that tune in your head before Sophia Gubaidelina really starts dissecting it. So you have a chance to get that melody in your head. And that's what she does in this violin concerto. She takes that melody and she just starts chopping it up like she a de musical She de decomposes it in a way. Uh, she, it's a series of variations and each variation starts from one note less of, so of the themes, meaning second variation would begin on the second note, the third on the third, etc., etc., until we reach the middle part of the, of the piece, which is this humongous violin cadenza. And then from, uh, after the cadenza, you will, you will hear incredibly beautiful solo by, by our, our principal cellist, which, as she describes, represents Via Dolorosa, the, the, the way to Golgotha, uh, which, which is uh, commented upon by all different soloists from the, from the orchestra, and it represents our humanity. So those onlookers looking at him going, carrying the cross, 
some are quite happy, some are laughing, some are crying with him. Uh, it's, 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 an, it's an amazing picture, unfortunately very true. And as Sofia Gubaidulina saws away bits of that theme so that we're just left with one note, that's the first third. The second third of this offertorium concerto um, is, is the cadenza itself. Right. And then the third one is, is the, what's left of it. Uh, and at the very, very end, an amazing thing happens. Violin plays a tune which we haven't heard before, but have we? It's the actual theme written backwards, and it still is beautiful. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's amazing. This, it, it's, it's called a mirror projection, and she, she uses the technique. This is from, and it connects perfectly to Webern, because this is, this is the technique that was used by the second Viennese school in the 12 tone system. So this is, we are wrapping this way the, 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 the whole program into one. And I love the connections, the religious connotations here, because not only did Bach dedicate every single of his, of his works to the glory of God, and faith is very important to Sofia Gubaidulina as well. It's just intrinsic to this piece of music, and as she is whittling away Bach's theme, um, decomposing, as you said, like she said, uh, you can't, you, there's no resurrection without death, right? So the theme dies and then is built again, but backwards. Yeah. It's, an, it's a remarkable piece of music. And you feel so passionately about this piece of music, um, I mean, as evidenced by you sitting here when most soloists would be back there warming up, right? I should have been practicing. <laughs> I know. So, so why is this piece of music so moving to you? For, for, the, for the very reason that we talked about for the last 20 minutes, it is more than just a piece of music. I think it's, it's, a, it's a human statement, it's a cultural statement, it's something that could represent us, for better or worse, in, in a higher places. Uh, I think it's important that we together experience it. And can you talk a little bit about that cadenza and how... If we start talking about cadenza, I'll leave and go practice. <laughs> It's that difficult? It's horrible. <laughs> well, that's an interesting point because as I listen to this, being not a string player and you know, only having heard this concerto myself a half a dozen times, it's hard for me to suss out just what makes this concerto so difficult. When you hear a Tchaikovsky concerto and you hear runs up and down, you know, I think, well, that's hard. What technically is so difficult about this? Well, there are runs. Uh, there are double stops. There, there, I remember learning this piece, uh, uh, almost shedding tears because I have simply had no understanding how in the world this segment is going, had to be played. I had to call Gideon Kramer and ask on bar so and so, what do you do? And he said, I, I, I don't play all the notes. <laughs> So at that, that, that moment, my, my self-pity was gone. <laughs> uh, but but th there, were, there were challenges that she, she presented, s demanding at one point that I find a sound of pan flute. And I did. <laughs> it, only, it took four hours. Uh, and she, she kept insisting that no, 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 that's, that's not it, and that's not it, and that's not it. Uh, so f somehow I, I did find it, but it, th there are many uh, minuscule details that, that take a lot of a lot of control and uh, a, a lot of technical uh, concentration, uh, and at the same time just maintaining this whole arch of, of, of the whole piece, and it it, it 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 really takes more than more than just a soloist to, to, to do this. It's, it's, a, it's a dedication of the whole orchestra conductor. It's, it really is a piece that, that it, it is so complex on so many levels that one is not enough. Are any of you aware that there is a Facebook group called Musicians of the Oregon Symphony? Good. Um, it's where musicians of the Oregon Symphony post their thoughts about visiting artists and what's going on with the orchestra. And that account has been going on and on about you. 
and I, I don't have Facebook, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> I noticed that. Um, but they're, I have to practice. They're all right. They're, they are wild about your... Are there orchestra players here today? I know there's a violinist in the audience. Emily is here, I think. Um, but they are wild about your playing. And I was like, why? So what makes Vadim Gluzman so amazing? And they're talking about your Russian approach to playing, your wholehearted Russian approach to playing. And being a non-violinist, I don't know exactly what that means. I, neither do I. But... I was going to say, can you tell me? But no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I studied in Latvia, Russia, Israel, Dallas, New York, Verbier, and the list can go on and on. Am, am I Russian? <laughs> You're Vadim. There is very, there is very li seriously speaking, I think schooling-wise, very little of, of my childhood uh, is, is left. So it may be wholehearted, but it's, I don't think it's Russian. <laughs> well, I do love that you're a champion of this piece of music, and it is remarkable. And it bears repeated listening. So I might even encourage you to come back on Monday and to hear him perform it again, because you hear how this theme decomposes and recomposes and is backwards and flip-flopped. It's... Uh, it's a, it's a challenge for sure. It is indeed. And we didn't even talk about the Eroica Symphony and our time is up, but think about like which piece of music could stand up to this violin concerto, Beethoven. Certainly symphony. Beethoven. <laughs> exactly. Certainly. <laughs> and our guest conductor, Matthew Halls, is the musical director of the Oregon Bach Festival, and he is magnificent. I'm assuming you've enjoyed working. Very much. One of those meetings when you meet a musician for the first time, and it seems like we've done it before many, many times. It's so easy, alarmingly easy. <laughs> <laughs> alarmingly easy. <laughs> well, you are fantastic. Thank you so much. I know he's going to talk about it a little bit more before the concert tonight because we've got a few hundred people here tonight and thousands in attendance. So you'll have a chance to ingest a little bit more information about Sofia Gubaidulina's Offertorium Concerto. And this is Vadim Gluzman. Thank you for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you.